Hello, I'm Mark Unkefer, uh, uh, FOSA's Executive Director, and welcome to our December webinar. Um, we're very pleased to have uh, uh, Etienne Rochat, who is actually who is CTO of uh, Omnisense, but will also be uh, uh, taking a more active role next year with our Technology Committee. Uh, and this presentation is entitled A Comprehensive Asset Integrity Monitoring Solution. So we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, much Mark, for the uh, kind introduction. And um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. A, a very warm greeting from Switzerland. Um, I, I'm going to speak about um, Omniscience, uh, who we are, what we do, and how we uh, go to the market with distributed fiber optic uh, sensing solution. And then I will follow in the talk by looking at the principle of distributed fiber optic sensing, reminding quickly what a DTS, a DSS, and DAS are. I talk about standards and application that we can do with those uh, technologies. Uh, then I have selected a, a couple of applications that I think are interesting. I will first speak about uh, long distance monitoring, explain why it's important to uh, monitor the full length of the cable and how we can handle the, the signal propagation on those long fibers to achieve the measurement. Um, then I will discuss about erosion monitoring um, in a bit of an un unusual way. I will look at sand dune movements on a terrestrial pipeline, and then I will jump to a, a subsea depth of burial cases to make a, a few comparisons. Then I will follow with the measurement of dynamic strain, looking at uh, mainly power cable integration and, and installation and the performances that we need uh, to do this. And eventually I will conclude. So, who are we? Well, um, Omnisense is a spin-off from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne. We are based on the shore of Lake Geneva. We have the Alps on the other side. Uh, we started 20 years ago, so we've been 20 years in the field this year. Kind of happy birthday. And um, as far as I can see from the, the map, we've been to the north and the south and the east and the west as far as we can uh, from Switzerland. We are working normally with large infrastructures um, in remote area, um, most of the time in harsh environment, and which are critical asset for the energy supply. That's kind of where we offer the asset integrity monitoring. I have a few pictures that I selected from uh, previous projects just to show where we've been. And we have our instruments and our people went to offshore platforms. We've been working on the long interconnectors, the longest one uh, to date being the, the Crete Peloponnese that we are currently installing. We've been doing subsea uh, pipelines and flow lines um, like the uh, ILA system or the Fendia project, which is the longest electrically trace heated pipe in pipe. Uh, we've been working on long pipelines everywhere and also uh, on multiple wind farms amongst which we've instrumented some of the uh, largest uh, one to date. We have a focused on energy. We uh, concentrate mainly on pipeline monitoring, uh, power cable monitoring and uh, subsea um, monitoring, but our instruments are also uh, used in the uh, civil engineering market, for instance, to monitor bridges, walls, dams. Um, they are used in the geotech industry as well uh, to measure, for instance, landslide, and um, there have been some uh, use also downhole. So, pretty much a, a large coverage of the applications that we can do um, with our technologies. We offer a solution, meaning that uh, we start by the cable and the interrogator by the asset, shown here um, as, as a pipeline. We measure a quantity, a temperature, a strain, a deformation, a, a vibration. And so basically we transform um, using a fiber optic cable an information from a sensor into a data and then we are going to process this data we will go through a monitoring software we do some alarm classification and generation we communicate communicate this uh, over SCADA to an end user so we transform the data into an information uh, feed this to the operator so that someone at the end of the day can take an action uh, based on what was measured originally by the cable so this is a, a brief overview of what a solution uh, features and, and what we are talking about when we say uh, this is a, a complete solution. 
It begins with an interrogator. Uh, we have our diet test, which is a Brillouin-based uh, temperature and strain measurement system. We have the ODAS, which is a really based measurement system. They have long distance capabilities, uh, featuring also a meter, meter-like uh, resolution. And then on top of that, we have uh, this monitoring software uh, that we branded under Lynx and Cobra names for the pipeline integrity and the power cable integrity. And uh, there is also the uh, surf approach for subsea medical riser and floor line. And um, then all this is integrated together. So it begins at the engineering phase of the project and then it follows with the project management all the way through so that eventually we can uh, deliver a automatic and attended permanent monitoring as you would expect uh, on such a structure. As I said, it begins at the designing phase and then we go to the installation and the commissioning. We have also maintenance services. Um, our field service engineers are qualified to go offshore, both for the oil and gas industry and for the uh, power cable industry. And as a company, we are also ISO certified uh, for uh, quality management, environment and also uh, health and safety. So this is the, the general overview of the company as such. And I'm going now to move to the uh, distributed sensing principle and remind you a little bit what DTS, TSS and DAS are. All that begins by an interrogator, which is sending a pulse of light down the fiber. And as the pulse propagates down the fiber, there will be a little bit of backscattering going towards the interrogator, which will be measure and analyze. The first thing we do with the backscattering is a time domain analysis, basically knowing the speed of the light in the fiber and having a good stopwatch. Uh, we can measure as a function of time when the backscattering arrives to the detector and it gives us the position where it was emitted. So this is basically the, the distance scale of the interrogator. That's the OTDR uh, part. Um, and it gives also the accuracy of the localization of the event, which is so crucial for the fiber optic monitoring. And then uh, we have a number of backscattering uh, to play with. We can play, for instance, with Raman scattering. Raman scattering is intensity sensitive to the temperature. Uh, we can play with Brillouin scattering, which is frequency or, or wavelength color sensitive to the temperature. And by measuring these, uh, we get a temperature profile over the distance of the cable. And if we apply the proper calibration coefficient, then we have the absolute measurement uh, over the distance. We can also, uh, looking at Brillouin, get an information on the elongation or compression along the fiber. Uh, so a strain effect, and then we can see things going up and down and changing over the distance uh, along the cable. And finally, we can look also at Rayleigh. Rayleigh was used first for the loss measurement on the fiber, but in this case, we are looking at, at Rayleigh on a trace-to-trace uh, -trace measurement without averaging, and we look at the evolution of the Rayleigh backscattering over time. And if things are changing over time uh, in a certain region, then uh, depending on the technology or the, the way Rayleigh is measured in the background, um, we can infer from uh, temperature variation or uh, elongation variation, or simply the fact that something is moving or is not, and relate this as, as energy variation and extract useful information from this. There, there is a key difference between the left side and the right side of those diagram. Um, on one side, we have an absolute measurement, which can be calibrated. On the other side, we have a relative measurement, so variation. And that is fundamental. Um, the DTS and the DAS and the DSS are not the, the same things. If we are looking at uh, Brillouin and Raman for, for temperature, Brillouin for strain, uh, we have a measure which is absolute for the temperature and the strain. We have a calibration process, and then from there we have a long-term stability. So if I look, I, I took the same picture, but let's say that it's now over time at a given position, maybe over days or the, or, or the weeks. Um, with a, a DTS system, we are going to measure the temperature over the time. Um, we, have, we can even sample um, something of, like once a week or once a month as we would do in geotechnology or maybe on a, on a big dam or, or something like this and we will have all those points which are measured and that belong to uh, a series uh, 
So the, the continuity of the measurement is guaranteed and the long-term stability as well. We can think of a major power cut, which is much longer than the uninterrupted power supply that was there. We can think of a fiber break that happens and then it takes time to repair the, the fiber. Never mind uh, when you come back to the system and you just keep uh, going on the, on the same curve. If you look at Rayleigh, at, at the phase sensitive version of, of Rayleigh, so at a subfamily of that measurement, uh, what you do is to accumulate deltas over time, small variation of temperature, small uh, variation of strain in an instantaneous way. So it's an integrator, uh, so to speak. Uh, it makes the long time sampling not possible because you, you need continuity in the measurement. You cannot stop and then go back, um, which somehow in some cases uh, is important. Um, if I use the DAS to accumulate the variation, then I will have a, a trace that starts more or less at zero. Um, if there is an interruption, it's a reset and it goes on like this. Well, you could always say, I know that's 30 degree and lift up the curve. Okay, still, I'm doing the integration of the time. Um, and if I follow the blue curve, uh, eventually that is a reset, uh, which makes the things different. The point behind this is that DTS and DSS and DAS are not interchangeable. They do specific measurements, and once you know that, then you can target which instrument you use for which application. Something that happened over the last year is um, standards being published to define how to do the measurement of those different uh, systems. Standards were first pushed by a C form, um, a consortium of people active um, in the oil and gas industry. Uh, they made uh, in 2014, 2016, a standard for the, temp the measurement of uh, temperature. And this was taken over by IEC as an international uh, standard body and became the IEC 61757 for the DTS. Um, CFOM also worked more recently on DAS released the C from MSP02, as it is known. And again, there was an agreement and transfer toward IEC. And shortly, uh, IEC will release the DAS version of the standard. Why is that important? Those standards, they define the, the key parameters of distributed fiber optic sensing. For instance, they define the how far, what is the, the longest distance measurement range you can have. Um, and basically it's as the crow flies. So you go from the interrogator as far as you can, that's the distance measurement range. It defines what the spatial resolution is, the how short, what is the shortest event that you can measure. Uh, it defines also the how long it takes, the measurement time, and the how well, which is critical for a DTS, the how well is the temperature repeatability and also the calibration. For a DAS, it's the dynamic range, the, the frequency response, the fidelity, uh, and the noise. Some key points from those uh, standards. Um, the different parameters that how far, how short, how long, how well, they are interdependent. So you cannot get just the best of each randomly. They are related through the physics, through the loss of the fibers, and through the noise of the instrument. And so each instrument has a signature that ultimately will define how you can play with those different parameters. It's not, if, not possible to have the best of them at the same time, meaning that you have to optimize them with respect to the application. So you decide that you will um, make something extremely long and you have to compromise on something else, or you want to measure in an extremely uh, short time and then you have to compromise on the other parameter. What we've seen uh, by experience, for instance, for a DTS, is that it's always better to favor short spatial resolution so the, the, the how short we can measure um, to get all the different issues and, and the temperature changes you have on the cable rather than uh, optimizing for an extremely good repeatability and compromising on the spatial resolution. That's what you get with um, some expertise and time. Also, what is interesting with those standards is that now when I'm talking to a customer saying my spatial resolution is one meter, then the person can go to the standard and see, oh, well, this is how they measured it. 
it, in, it means this and this and that, and I know exactly what this is. And so we have all a common language and we have um, common test methods to guarantee that when you compare instrument or when you are in the field and you claim something, um, then you know how this was designed and what were the, the criteria to achieve this. If we look now at the uh, application, and I borrowed this slide from uh, FOSA Technology Committee, um, to which I tried to actively participate, um, we see that the, the, the field of application is extremely uh, wide. Um, it, it begins with pipeline and finishes with power cable monitoring or the other way around, but you went through uh, transport monitoring and oil and gas in one monitoring, and we are talking about geotechnology and large structure, just to name a few. So there are really a number of things that we can do, provided obviously that there is a fiber somewhere in the vicinity. I revisited this slide a little bit uh, based on the technology that uh, we have at Omnisense and the, the market that we are looking at in priority. So looking at what we can do with temperature strain and acoustic in the power market, the pipeline and the subsea. And then we could continue the list for the application, but obviously it would be much longer than the page. So if we look at power cable and temperature, uh, we can detect hotspots. And once we have that temperature and hotspot detection, we can start playing with uh, dynamic cable rating, handle the load, and also have access to the depth of burial. We can find some faults uh, using DTS as well. Strain measurement uh, is interesting for the bending me radius measurement and tensile load measurement in view of the installation of the cable. And once you have the possibility to measure strain during operation, you could look at the free span, sagging, potentially fatigue, uh, lateral dragging due to anchor drops and other things like this. But if you want to detect the anchor drop, then likely the DAS is the most suitable instrument and it will also help you uh, to find some fault. Looking at pipeline, uh, temperature is very good at finding incipiently the, the very small one when you have a delta T. Uh, for geohazard prevention, it's looking at erosion, but strain is looking at ground movement, which is another geohazard, and also at pipeline deformation, provided you instrumented the, the pipeline. Acoustic will give you third-party intrusion, seismic activities, large leaks as well. Subsea in a pipe in pipe, uh, temperature is a, is a good measurement of leak and for finding and depth of burial. Uh, strain will pretty much give you the same as for power cable and likewise for acoustic. So for the continuation of the talk, I decided to select three applications in that uh, table, uh, not focusing on the one that we hear all the, all the time about, like third-party intrusion or another, but trying to uh, focus on some interesting features which we don't hear about so much. So one is about uh, temperature measurement for power cable, but especially in view of long-distance monitoring and the importance to measure the full cable. The second application is about erosion, again with temperature uh, on, on the pipeline. And the last one is about dynamic banking strain that uh, we performed originally on subsea power umbilical and looking to the installation of power cable. So let's go to the uh, power cable long distance um, monitoring. What's the purpose in the background? We want to go green, we want to have a lot of offshore wind energy that's seen as a uh, crucial low carbon emission electricity sources. Uh, in Europe, um, it's foreseen that uh, there will be a 50 times uh, increase over the next 20 years of the production of um, offshore uh, electricity. Uh, we are talking about a massive amount of gigawatt uh, wind farm. So, I mean, assuming a, a one gigawatt wind farm, that means about 500 wind farm uh, within the next 20 years, and a uh, number of kilometers of interconnectors that we need to uh, measure. Also, interestingly, um, there is a push to go further away offshore with also deeper water. And that's uh, where you have the, the largest possibility to install um, wind farms, probably um, floating wind. And this also requires um, measurement of the, of the cable. The, the key is to make sure that the cable is safe and the production can be transferred from the farm to the shore. So we need distributed fiber optic sensing for this uh, with the associated software. 
So why is it important to have full distance coverage? Well, perturbations, they happen everywhere. If you look at seabed migration, for instance, um, if you have too much sand accumulating on the cable, it's likely to be a hotspot. If you have too little, uh, you may have free span. It's a cold spot. Um, if you have a cable in free span, it's more sensitive to uh, anchors drag, to uh, fishing gears and so on. You may have some fatigue, so you would like to, to know about that. Uh, human activities happen everywhere. Uh, we've seen a, a cable where, um, well, by, by uh, bad luck, people started composting on top of the cable. That's really an unexpected hotspot. Uh, fishing gears happen everywhere. So it's not limited to the, the shore to sea transitions, not limited to the HDDs, not limited to the J-tube. Um, it's really uh, all over the place. So having full monitoring allows for the management of all thermal bottleneck. And it provides also a pre precise event localization which ultimately should reduce the uh, reaction time and repair time in case of a massive failure. An example, um, the Mosa Sicily interconnector went down uh, last December, apparently due to a vessel that dropped an anchor and made some uh, turnaround there and then went away. So why is that important? Uh, from an environment point of view, Originally, the interconnector drives power from Italy to Malta, and in Italy, there is about 30% of renewable uh, energy in the mix. In Malta, they have an emergency power station, um, and the production of uh, CO2 equivalent per day is larger uh, from that emergency power station with respect to uh, the interconnector and the production in Italy. That's the environmental impact. There is also a financial impact uh, based on the newspaper data, so that's public material. The, the cost of the emergency regeneration is about 150 uh, kilo euros per day. And the repair uh, started mid-February this year, was completed about a month later, meaning that altogether the cable was down uh, a bit more than three months. So if we had a full dust monitoring on this. I think that uh, repair time could have been made shorter. You have a direct understanding of what happened. And maybe it's a dream, but someone could have said to the vessel, please go back in the other direction and stop messing around. Well, don't know if it's feasible, but let's dream a little bit. Uh, another example, which is related to a uh, temperature, is the uh, BritNet cable that is um, linking the Netherlands to uh, the UK going there. Uh, it's a one gigawatt uh, interconnector, 260 kilometer long. It has DTS on both sides, uh, 22 kilometer on the um, UK side and 29 on the uh, Netherlands side. And the reason that the DTS doesn't go further than that is not because it cannot, it's because there is no fiber beyond that. So it's, it's a design uh, choice, fiber on each side up to a certain distance, then stop. And the system is used to trade electricity, so you can apparently buy some capacity for a year, for a quarter. And then they play with the availability of the load to push a bit more uh, on, on the daily capacity or on the intraday capacity. What if we had full DTS coverage on that cable? Well, we could identify unexpected uh, thermal limit exception, so we could uh, work with the real-time thermal rating software, we could manage the overrating better, we could increase the capacity potentially. We could be looking at depth of burial computation. Apparently, at the design phase, it was uh, identified that um, sand wave would move on the cable and ultimately would expose it. And apparently, the cable is surveyed on a regular basis to look for this. Well, you could follow that real time uh, with changes on the uh, temperature. So had we a DTS on there, I think that possibly we could have a uh, larger load capacity on the interconnector and less costs for that. So can we do that? Well, yes. Um, using um, Brillo Optical Time Domain Analyzer, so the stimulated version of the Brillo system, um, we can combine that with optical amplifiers, basically what is used in telecommunication system uh, along the fibers all the, all the time. And if 
we use those systems and if we locate them for instance at the end of the, the loop which is using VOTDA and then we measure in both direction then it's possible to cover distances up to around 250 kilometers these days uh, it's not a fancy scheme it's something that uh, is field proven we installed the uh, first offshore version of that system back in uh, 2017 and we are now commissioning the uh, Crete Peloponnese interconnector which is 180 kilometer long so reaching those, those systems with the full cable coverage no dead zone in the middle section and we can also play with different um, measurement cycles so we can do a um, um, short measurement over the, let's say the first 10 or 20 kilometer where the hdd usually is so short spatial resolution short measurement time good repeatability and then do a measurement which goes to the uh, center there and optimize this uh, to have the, the best performances in all the uh, situation Crete Peloponnese that I was mentioning um, is the uh, longest fully measured power cable so far. About 135 kilometer subsea, 180 kilometer total route, as I said, a DTS on both sides. Why is that important and what is the outcome of the system? Well, with those DTS, we have good performances for the real-time thermal rating of the cable. We have a short spatial resolution, typically five meter in the, in the middle, which means a good detection of local hotspot. We have a short measurement time. We are talking about uh, 15 minutes for the, the measurement, um, and that's much shorter than the cable thermal response, so we can follow that nicely. And if we look at the uh, repeatability, two-thirds of the cable has a repeatability below 0.5 degree at one sigma, um, and 90% is below one degree at one sigma. So very good um, repeatability over most of the of the route and just the last 10 percent is within 1.5 degree which is largely sufficient for a good real-time thermal rating computation we can do more i call that endless sensing a bit teasing uh, essentially it's combining uh, subsea optical repeaters like they are used for cross-Atlantic or cross-Pacific uh, fiber communication. And so by cascading uh, those systems uh, in this example that we uh, developed a couple of years ago, every 65 kilometers or so, uh, then you can really go with a single instrument to uh, very large distances. The trial then was uh, 330 kilometer with three meter spatial resolution and the results at the end of the 330 kilometer um, was better than 2.5 degree uh, at two sigma. So uh, something very impressive for a structure like this. And I'm looking forward to installing a, something like this once on, on a real uh, power cable. It works for sure. Let's move now to erosion monitoring. And uh, I will use the case of the uh, Peru LNG pipeline in South America as an example. That pipeline is a 34 inches high pressure natural gas pipeline, a bit more than 400 kilometer. It crosses the Andes, top at 4,900 meter. Um, it's connected to the TGP pipeline also somewhere on the road. And it ends up at Melhorita there on the Pacific coast. You may have seen some pictures in the past. Uh, you have the pipe and right of way going just straight up the mountains down on the other side. And if you look at the coastal section, uh, you have dunes there that are moving uh, with the wind resulting in erosion. Fortunately, there is a telecommunication cable along the full route that can be used uh, for monitoring. On those slopes, it's basically for ground movement and on those dunes, it's for erosion. Why is that important? Well, sometimes the pipeline is exposed due to the uh, aeolian uh, erosion. And well, apart from the fact that the depth of cover is a legal requirement, it's also a protection for the pipeline. So when you don't have sand anymore on the pipe, the pipe is at risk. So the people out there um, are inspecting the right of way about twice a year uh, for people patrolling there and they measure uh, the amount of sand you have on the pipe and they have some um, landmarks to, to know where the pipe is and to evaluate uh, what is happening there. So could we, with temperature for instance, uh, get uh, information that is important for the, the people operating the pipeline? And the answer is yes. 
So what can we do? Well, let's think about the thermal behavior of the soil around the pipeline and see if the DTS can, can do that. Um, assuming that in six months or so, the pipeline can be exposed. So it's not a five minutes measurement job. We have time to, to see the evolution of the, of the dune. If we look at temperature, first, there is a daily variation. 24 hour period, day night fluctuation. That doesn't propagate very deep in the soil. Uh, in fact, it attenuates as it goes deeper and deeper and about half a meter from the surface, it's flat. That's what we see on there with the uh, largest uh, bump, which is the day night fluctuation. And as we go into the soil, it gets smoother and smoother. And we see also that there is a phase shift as we go down in the, in the soil. And then there is the yearly seasonal variation, summer, winter, uh, from higher temperature to lower temperature and so on. That goes to much deeper um, depth along the pipeline. The, the first few meters, you will uh, still see the, the influence. When you are below 10 meters or so, then it's again completely flat. So where the pipeline is uh, located, let's say about a meter, a meter and a half or so, you don't expect any more daily variation. So the only thing you should see is the yearly variation, which at the 15 minutes measurement speed is extremely long. So looking at a few days, essentially temperature is constant. So if you do see a variation of temperature that has a periodicity of around 24 hours, you know that you are getting close to the surface or the surface is getting close to the pipeline rather. And that's exactly what we've been looking for on this particular position. So um, there were some reference um, temperature in that BART station and then we were looking at an event uh, there which is about uh, 328 kilometers from the uh, end of the, the pipe. And so assumption is if we have a variation with the 24 hour period, then it's related to the fact that the material thickness is, is limited. And the 24 hour period is given by the natural fluctuation, doesn't depend on the, on the depth. And if we can find a delay uh, between those measurements, then uh, we can probably get an indicator of the erosion. So there were some measurements there where we see uh, variations which have a 24 hour period, uh, some with large variations, some with much smaller variations. So we can already say that probably here the pipeline is almost exposed and then here there is a bit more sand on top of that. And if we look, for instance, on this particular event here, so we have the blue trace, which is the reference as measured uh, there. And then we have the red trace, which is the erosion event. And we see the 24 hours period and we see the shift uh, from the main uh, ambient temperature. And we see that if we are a bit further upstream from that erosion event, then the curve is essentially flat, meaning that we are below 50 centimeter depth of cover in this particular case. Uh, from that, uh, we can estimate the um, depth of cover. So if we look at the uh, daily fluctuation and uh, the first event there, uh, we see that there is about five hour phase shift, which would correspond to a 10 centimeter uh, depth of cover. Uh, if we look at the second one, which is attenuated, so meaning deeper, uh, we have about 10 hour uh, shift, which correspond to uh, 20 centimeter. And that's the type of information that you can feed to the operator uh, to, to make something on the pipe. Now, there were some remedial works. Um, they came with the, the machine there, put the sand back on the pipe, and sure enough, directly after that, you stop the 24-hour oscillation at the event, and you get flat again and go back to uh, the homogeneous, homogeneous temperature with respect to the rest of the pipeline. Short spatial resolution, otherwise you are going to miss those uh, short events combined with good temperature repeat repeatability, that's crucial. And once you have that, you can accurately uh, localize the erosion event, you can estimate the depth of cover, um, and then eventually you can improve and rationalize the, the maintenance activities. And good news, it can be deployed in sensitive areas as long as uh, there is a fiber optic cable there. Now I'm making a big jump from the beach to the water and showing basically something the other way around, uh, which is excess of material on a cable. 
In this case, it's uh, about 80 kilometer uh, subsea power cable um, that was installed, that's the red curve, at a fixed distance from the seabed, which is the bluish, light bluish curve. When we started the measurement quite some time later, surprisingly, we had bumps in the temperature traces every time there was a dip in the seabed. And this was a bit puzzling, but then discussing with the people operating the cable that said, they have given the time between the survey and the installation and the time between the measurement, it's likely that there was sun migration and then now it's kind of flat in there. So there is no dip anymore in the seabed. It's completely flat all the way through. Meaning that now what we have is a increase in the depth of burial, then come back to the nominal value, increase in the depth of burial and so on. And in this particular case, as expected, the increase in depth of burial will result in a um, larger temperature. And a high load. There is a risk of exceeding the cable maximum temperature in those positions. And then obviously, again, um, this is at short distance, but would this be in the middle of a cable? If you don't know that, you may run into issues. And so here the DTS uh, provides information on the uh, cable burial deviation from the S-build and allows a good load management, taking into account the real status of the cable. Let's move now to dynamic strain monitoring. Um, we have some challenges in the offshore power cable industry. If you look at available data from the net, you see that Carbon Trust reported about 200 million pounds insurance claims uh, over the, the last 15 years or so. Just in the UK, uh, Wind Power Monthly reported 60 million euros insurance claim just for 2015, uh, 4C Offshore UK uh, listed some uh, incident also and arrived to something like uh, 350 million euro uh, over the same period, so large numbers. And um, also there was a report by the Offshore Wind Program Board showing the cost that um, results from issues on, on cable and you are talking about millions of pounds loss uh, for any single cable. A failure mechanism, there was a recent report from Catapult in the UK showing that um, a large part of that is the um, related to uh, manufacturing and installation, mechanical damages. In installation, if you look at other publication and things uh, here and there, you see that mainly it's um, a bending radius which is exceeded or the tensile load during its installation which is exceeded. And then you see also um, external damages often related to fishing activities. Um, Sigre recently updated his brochure on the uh, service experience of uh, high voltage engine ground and submarine cable system, seeing or showing that 64% um, of the reported faults were internal, and that includes uh, damages resulting from the installation, but couldn't get better information than that. And looking at the external fault, uh, 80% of them are mechanical damages, which I understand like fishing gear um, and an anchor and probably other um, things like this. And most of them, almost 60%, appear on the cable itself. So it's critical to uh, measure all these uh, places. By the way, the cable cost in the wind farm is about 10% of the total cost. So there is a, a massive pressure on the cable. And I think that's a the use case of the justification for why we need monitoring starting at the production through the installation process and during the full operation of the cable. One way of making sure that the installation works properly is by looking at the uh, tensile load and the pending radius during installation. Well essentially to begin with it's simple physics. You put let's say uh, a few sensors um, around the, the power cable inside in 120 degree um, separation. You look at the elongation given by the bending. It's simply the distance to the neutral axis divided by the bending radius. And then from that and a little bit of mathematics, you extract the elongation, the bending radius and the bending direction if everything is uh, nicely made. Um, we did uh, a little experiment. So we took a, a tube in PVC. We added some fibers in helix around that, um, bended the tube, and then we see that a nice sine wave 
dumb sine wave shape, meaning that here the, the tube is straight, here it's really bended, here it's straight again. You see the, the phase shift between the fibers, that's due to the helix. And when you compute from those measurements to the curvature, uh, you get that type of, of uh, curve, which is close to the uh, theoretical calculation. And if there is a, a gap between the uh, measured curvature or the computed curvature and the theoretical curvature, it's just because uh, I'm not really a mechanical engineer, so I made some mistakes in the background. So it works. Um, we deployed this already a couple of years ago, first in a uh, two times three phases power umbilical, where we put a cable combining strain sensing fiber and temperature sensing fiber in the center of that system. This is four millimeter diameter, so it gives you the scale of the, of the umbilical there. The cable was designed to withstand the uh, manufacturing process, the integration into the into the system, and in the machinery, the cable was uh, well. I had to make it big with a with a red line. Don't see it, but going in the center of the system. What is interesting is that we measured the the Brillouin response of that strain sensing fiber before and after integration, and apart from the, this position there, where the, the crew said we had an issue with the uh, the system. Everywhere else, there is a good matching between uh, the strain, uh, the, um, the Brillouin curve before and after integration, meaning that first, the cable survived. Second, it was extremely well integrated. And then we did a similar job uh, in a slightly different umbilical, where we added this time three um, transducer combining temperature and strain in the system, made some bending tests as seen on the video, uh, some elongation tests. We see that uh, there is a good homogeneity between the three sensors and, and the load. And if we look at this, which looks like noisy um, trace, but which is not, what we see there are just the cycle going up and down, up and down for a very long uh, bending test we are talking about multiple days and we see this is the red curve at the bottom a slight increase in temperature due to the uh, friction and, and the accelerated test there and if we compensate for the temperature on the strain measurement that we would do in a system like this that we see that we have a perfectly flat um, system where from which we could measure uh, the bending radius so what is the next step? Well, uh, sorry for the very naive drawing. Um, I wish I can get my interrogator by these massive uh, power cables pull on the vessel and then start measuring the bending radius, the tensile load, the bending radius again as the vessel is installing the cable. And if we get some numbers, well, typically uh, a cable like this may have a bending radius in the, let's say, five meter or so. Uh, I assume for the sake of the discussion that the cable goes up at 45 degree, meaning that the, the bending part there is about four meter long. That gives me the, the minimum spatial resolution. It has to be four meter or shorter. Um, if we assume that the cable is 10 millimeter off center, that's purely an assumption, then we are talking about 0.2% uh, elongation, 2000 micro strain. Give me the uh, resolution of the instrument. I need to see maybe a tenth of that, also 100 micro strain. And if you think about the, the installation speed, it gives you also uh, the acquisition time you need for the system something like two seconds and so basically that's uh, what the interrogator needs to achieve for the the job and that's what we can achieve with our system so far uh, it's about time to conclude um, so distributed fiber optic sensing is a comprehensive asset integrity monitoring solution i think i've demonstrated that during this uh, webinar uh, we have access to temperature, DTS, strain, DSS, and acoustic, DAS. It's a major technology, single mode fiber based. It does bring long distance coverage and dynamic acquisition too. It has a wide application range. Um, I mentioned the energy market with uh, third party intrusion, detection, hotspot, cable rating, erosion, depth of burial, uh, elongation bending, deformation, fault finding. Uh, just to name a few, uh, there are also standalone instrumentation for civil engineering and geotechnology, and then we could make the, the list longer and longer and longer. Uh, we are working with standards 
and those basically allow us to select the the appropriate combination of parameters and to explain to the people why the parameters are linked uh, together. Based on that, we tend to push for short spatial resolution and fast measurement rather than a long spatial resolution and huge averaging time. Um, and something which is absolutely important, we need to match the uh, proper instrument to the application. As I said before, DTS, DSS, and DAS, they don't do the same thing. They are not interchangeable. So we need to select the most suitable technology, the most suitable instrument for an application. We need to define whether we can work in absolute or in relative mode. And when necessary, uh, we have to combine technologies and maybe use one of each. And also extremely important for the application, uh, we need to provide a full coverage of the, the cable or the asset. And also, uh, a good data is fundamental for the application software. So if you want to do a real-time thermal rating, if you want to do depth of burial, if you want to compute a bending radius, you need to have good data and therefore a good instrumentation running in the background. Having said that, uh, thank you very much for listening. And I suppose the time is now open for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Etienne. And for those who want to ask a question, you can put something into uh, the text box and we'll pass them on to uh, be answered. Uh, but let me ask you the chicken and the egg question, and, and that is, uh, which is more important, the software or the interrogator? <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Well, I think um, we sometimes say uh, garbage in, garbage out. Uh, in a polite way. I think if you have a poor interrogator, as there's not much you can do with the software. So for me, um, the, the quality of the data is absolutely fundamental. Uh, if you want to do a real-time thermal rating, you have poor DTS quality, bad calibration, uh, and, and so on then what you get from the RTTR will not allow you to uh, overload the cable and, and maybe to handle the risk associated to the, to the cable. Also, I think it's, um, it's important to understand the full chain. Um, so you need to understand the physics, you need to understand the interrogator, you need to understand how to process data uh, in the best way and how to push this into the subsequent mathematics uh, in order to, to get the most of that. So I would say clearly software is important, but you don't get good values out of a software unless you really have uh, good data from the from the hardware. I hope it gives some, some uh, proper answer to that uh, question. And, and I'm sure uh, some of our members would emphasize the uh, uh, cable as well, right? Um, <laughs> Well, yes, obviously. Well, yes. <laughs> we, won't, we won't start a fight here. Uh, so one commenter noted the uh, that uh, Malta Sicily uh, example, and the question was: uh, Was there uh, any indication of damage shown in the temperature or excessive strain on the cable? Not that I'm aware of. Um, as far as I know, there was a report that the cable was broken and that was the, uh, the end of the story. And what I've learned and what I've shared basically uh, is something that I found on the, uh, on the internet, uh, on the newspaper, uh, because uh, failure on an interconnector like this is, is quite a massive failure. So to my knowledge, no, there was, uh, there was no signature being seen. Not saying that there were not, I'm just saying that. I, I don't know basically, but maybe someone somewhere has access to the instrumentation and to the data uh, to check this. Yes, it, it, one, another comment was kind of ask on uh, if you had some information to share on sort of the cost benefit associated. Now I know, I, I do know that you, you referenced the cost of adding cable to um, the um, uh, electric transmission, electric transmission examples, but sort of broader the overall package, or what are the trade-offs that exist for that? Um, it, it's a difficult one because uh, to some extent, uh, if, if you use, for instance, a, a DTS um, to, to drive the cable harder, 
uh, using a real-time uh, thermal rating software, and people have doing this. Um, there was a, a case study that uh, we published a couple of years ago, and you can still find uh, on our website, um, for a, a terrestrial cable in Belgium, uh, known as the Coxide Slacken Interconnector. It's not very long, it's about 40 kilometers, something like this, 40, 45. Uh, and that cable used to be a bottleneck in the uh, in the power network up there um, they uh, retrofitted uh, a dts uh, with a real-time thermal rating on top of that and then they could safely manage the load on that uh, cable and so they, they didn't have any uh, power cut or any restriction in the load anymore so what was a bottleneck became a, a way of transferring uh, electricity in a very nice way and apparently um, they, they use if i understood correctly to to be fined because um, they could not properly push the load and and now it's not the case anymore so in that sense i cannot evaluate uh, what you can earn uh, from having a DTS on, on a cable like this. But I can imagine that uh, from, from an operator point of view, there must be massive saving on, on this. Uh, if you look at the uh, mole to CCD, um, just, just think, I mean, that, that number of about 150 kilo euro per day for the emergency power generation. Um, if you can save, uh, let's say just 10 days or, or 30 days, of electricity just because you can go faster to the side you recognize uh, quicker you understand uh, faster what the issue was you are directly talking about millions of euros of saving for that so i, I would say um the added value of monitoring for the uh, for the power cable industry at least offshore wind and so on is is massive uh, if you look the same on pipeline uh, well you don't expect the pipeline to have a leak but if you do have a leak, then suddenly you are talking about hundreds of millions of, of um, euros or dollars or whatever uh, to, to repair, to replace, to clean and, and, and all that. Well, obviously, that's the value of the monitoring. You know, it's interesting. One of the commenters made the observation, or one of the questioners uh, made the observation of the sort of cost benefit is the loss of reputation on the part of the, uh, the asset owner when you run into a problem that uh, could have been anticipated and uh, uh, was not identified in time. So uh, obviously that's clearly definitely, that's clearly a factor that ought to be considered as well. Um, but let me take another question, which is um, using some of these wind farm examples, Are do you have any general numbers as to the, uh, particularly in Europe, the uh, extent to which um, fiber optic sensing is used in electric transmission sort of this is like uh, the market penetration question difficult to to give a market percentage i mean you should never ask a cto on market percentage and things like this i suppose <laughs> but um I, I would say currently most if not all wind farms being installed in europe are instrumented at least uh with a dts and it's it's not even a question. I mean, you, you build a wind farm um, here, you have a DTS, full stop. So it, it's almost 100% market penetration, slightly exaggerating probably, but it, it's very uh, it's very common. Um, for transmission, if you look at a power headline, then very little. Uh, apparently, we, we didn't manage as a as, um, DTS community or fiber sensing community to really address the market over, of over headline. So little application. Um, land cable buried, getting more and more as well uh, for third party intrusion and for the for the management of the load. So very good penetration on the market, I would say anyway. And I guess that answer really sets up uh, the next question, which is uh, to talk about the sort of integration of different uh, um, different technologies at different sensing solutions and how they can work together and uh, would you kind of elaborate on that yes for, for me i think it's key to consider all the technologies so uh, nobody should limit himself to a das or to a dss or to a to a dts um i think it's always good and, and clever to consider multiple uh, methods um, for instance if i take again the example of the of the power cable 
the DTS is going to help a lot for the operation. I mean, I said that a number of times. You, you manage the thermal bottleneck. Uh, you can maybe reduce the number of survey on the cable because you can compute the depth of burial. Um, so that, that's that's what you can do with the DTS. Uh, you can find fault with the DTS, but the DAS seems to be a better tool, tool uh, to find a short circuit than the DTS is. So why would you limit yourself to the DTS or to the DAS uh, if by combining both uh, you get a, a better outcome, a, a better understanding on, of the cable? And if I push a bit further, um, had we the possibility to measure the, the bending and, and the tensile load during installation, then you could say, okay, the cable was overbended. I don't think the, the, measure, the measurement will allow to prevent the bending. I mean, you, you got a big wave on the vessel, the cable went kink a little bit, that's it. But at least you know where. And therefore, during the, the operation, if you, if you get a short ticket exactly at that position, then you know why you had the short circuit. If you see a hot spot at this position, then you can also relate it to the installation. And maybe you can say, okay, now it's time to repair before I have a power cut, or I think I can go a bit longer. And then you can plan the repair rather than reacting um, to, to an emergency situation. Um, and I suppose that uh, we could get other examples for other fields uh, as well. So for me, it's important to, to consider the combination of, of technologies. That's really fundamental. And in, uh, we've, we've touched on, we've actually in the question sort of focused on uh, the electric transmission examples, but in some of the other applications as well, um, you have the potential for integration with, uh, uh, with other technologies as well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. And are we? How are we progressing on the sort of market penetration or the installation that's uh, taking place in in those examples? With respect to combination of technologies, or generally speaking? Generally speaking. Hmm. Well. Um, on the one hand, when you see the um, market data that people are trying to uh, to sell here and there, um, it's increasing like mad. Um, well, probably that uh, it's over optimistic, but uh, I, I do see attraction. And uh, nowadays, people are asking for monitoring. Um, don't have to to push and say well monitoring is important i think the the end user understand what you can do with the distributed fiber optic sensing they are aware of the of the potential there um on the engineering side as well on on the buyer side on the operation side as well so for me it's really a, a growing market there is a lot of opportunity it's moving forward and, and it's fascinating it's absolutely fascinating again cannot give numbers um but it, it's there, I think it's growing, uh, and that's important. And uh, so my, probably what will be our last question is, uh, what are the limits to what measurement, the strain acoustics uh, that can be done over uh, large distances with repeaters? Well, I think we could almost go endless. Uh, sometimes I think that the telecommunication people, they can handle 6,000 kilometers of fibers, um, and Basically, we use the same fibers, we use pretty much the same wavelength, um, so why not? And if I had a dream, I, I would say let's go for an endless sensing and, and let's shoot for a thousand kilometers or, or something like this. Um, obviously, we need to find someone who is willing to, to try. For me, it's more a, an engineering problem than a fundamental problem, and I think that's uh, something which is doable. Is that economical or no? That's a bit too early to say, but as we get longer and longer interconnector, for instance, uh, we have also uh, large pipelines, but uh, a terrestrial pipeline doesn't have that long link with anything in between. But as, as uh, transportation of electricity is getting over a longer and longer distance, I think at some point uh, we will we will largely exceed the, the 250 kilometer that we have now and then maybe go to 300, 400, 500 or something like this. Let's dream a little bit and, and shoot for that. Well, that's a great note to end on, is a bit of a sort of technology aspiration. <clears throat> I, I will answer a perennial question, which is just to remind people that uh, your presentation, this whole webinar will be 
up on uh, FOSA's website, or on the website, but linking to the uh, YouTube page, which uh, includes uh, quite a few resources uh, in, in a variety of uh, in specialized applications. But Etienne, thank you very much for what has been a very informative uh, presentation. Thank and you, Mark. It has been a pleasure. And that concludes this webinar.